In this video, we are going to examine intermolecular interactions. We will examine different types of intermolecular interactions and how they affect physical properties of different compounds. First, we are going to examine different types of intermolecular interactions. London interactions are present in all molecules, but they are most important in non-polar molecules. Polar molecules exhibit other types of much stronger intermolecular interactions. London interactions are weak, and uh, they tend to be very weak in small molecules, but they end up being much stronger in larger molecules. We will examine reasons for that very soon. Another type of intermolecular interactions are dipole-dipole interactions, and they are moderate to strong. They are characteristic of polar molecules. An average dipole-dipole interaction is about 100 times stronger compared to an average London interaction. So for that reason, when we are considering polar molecules, even though they exhibit London interactions, of course, because London interactions are present in all molecules, and dipole-dipole interactions, we usually consider only dipole-dipole interactions because ignoring London interactions uh, introduces very small error. So they can be safely ignored. Then we have hydrogen bond as very strong intermolecular interaction. That's actually a special case of dipole-dipole interaction. And hydrogen bond is present in molecules that have nitrogen-hydrogen, oxygen-hydrogen, or fluorine-hydrogen bond. As I already mentioned, it's very strong intermolecular interaction, and average hydrogen bond is about 100 times stronger compared to an average dipole-dipole interaction. So typically, when molecule exhibits hydrogen bonding, we ignore other interactions, even though the same molecule will also exhibit dipole-dipole and London interactions in addition to hydrogen bonding. Finally, we have one special type of interaction, ion-dipole interaction, which is very strong interaction, but it's present only in solution, and only in solution of ionic compound in polar solvents. As you probably know from general chemistry course, ionic compounds are dissociated into individual ions in solution, in solution of polar solvents. So those ions form ion-dipole interactions with molecules of solvent. Typically such solvent is water, but it could also be some polar organic solvent, such as acetone, tetrahydrofurane, or acetonitrile. London interactions are by far the most common intermolecular interactions. Of course, since they are present in all molecules, they have to be the most common. London interactions are sometimes also called van der Waals interactions. Proper name is London interactions. Term van der Waals interactions is reserved for all the intermolecular interactions in general. London interactions are predominant intermolecular interactions in nonpolar molecules. They are due to temporary and induced dipoles. Due to thermal motion in molecules, both electron clouds and atomic nuclei move quite a bit. In fact, electron clouds uh, move a lot um, simply due to thermal motion of electrons. Electron is a cloud. So as a result of thermal motion, here nuclei are shown as fixed even though they also move. As a result of thermal motion, there is imbalance, temporary short-lived imbalance of electric charge. That means that one end of the molecule acquires partial negative charge and the other partial positive charge as nucleus is closer to one end of the molecule and excess of electron density to the other. That temporary dipole induces dipole in the neighboring molecule. So positive end of the dipole attracts electrons from the neighboring molecule, and uh, there is electrostatic interaction between the two. In the same way, negative end attracts nucleus of the other molecule, and again, due to electrostatic interaction, there is intermolecular interaction. So those are attractive intermolecular interactions. In general, intermolecular interactions are attractive, but at very short distance, when molecules are compressed to very close uh, distance together, when electron clouds begin to penetrate each other, they become repulsive. So, as a general rule, all of the intermolecular interactions should be considered attractive. So, London interactions are due to temporary and induced 
dipoles and they are weak intermolecular interactions. Obviously they are weak because these are very, in terms of intensity of the degree of charge separation, these are very weak dipoles and they are also short-lived. So for that reason, interactions are weak. Before we consider dipole-dipole interactions, we should briefly review polar and non-polar molecules. Uh, we can uh, examine non-polar molecules on the simplest example of diatomic molecule. So in this schematic representation of non-polar diatomic molecule, molecule composed of two atoms, two atomic nuclei are shown in red. Core electrons that surround those atomic nuclei are shown in dark blue. And valence electrons are shown in light blue. So valence electrons surround the entire molecule. Since the two atoms are either identical or have very similar electronegativities, there is no distortion of electron cloud. And if electron cloud is not distorted, there is no charge separation, so molecules are non-polar. The only interactions that exist, intermolecular interactions that exist among such molecules are London interactions that we have just covered. Typically, we, re we would represent such non-polar molecule like this as simply uh, two uh, electron clouds without any charge separation. An example of polar molecule would be molecule like this, which is uh, methyl bromide. This is very simplified representation of methyl bromide. So on the left, we have carbon atom. So its, nu its nucleus is shown in black and its core electrons in dark blue surrounding the nucleus. Hydrogen, uh, hydrogen atoms attached to this carbon are not shown. And then bromine is shown to the right with its nucleus shown in red and core electrons in dark blue. Electron cloud in this case is distorted toward bromine and again it's shown in light blue. So in this case we have much more electronegative atom, atom of bromine attached to carbon. And because of the difference in electronegativities, more electronegative atom attracts shared electrons towards itself and so electron cloud is distorted towards bromine so there is excess negative charge around bromine atom and excess positive charge around carbon atom. So there is charge separation and this molecule is a dipole. So this is a polar molecule. Schematic representation of charge separation is as shown here, where we roughly represent the shape of the molecule and we indicate negative charge typically in red and positive charge in green, and then uh, charge, and then transition of charges in intermediate colors. Now we can consider dipole-dipole interactions. Dipole-dipole interactions are principal intermolecular interactions between polar molecules. So here we have bromomethane as an example of typical organic polar molecule. Uh, we have seen that a minute ago that this is a schematic representation of carbon bromine bond with hydrogens not shown. And this shows distortion of electron cloud with bromine being negative end of the dipole and carbon being positive end of the dipole. This is how we usually represent such uh, dipoles or such polar molecules. And dipole-dipole interactions are interactions where such molecules orient themselves so that positive end of one dipole is surrounded by as many negative ends of the other dipoles as possible and vice versa. Negative end is surrounded by as many positive ends as possible. In a solid, of course, there would be crystal lattice where such arrangement is ordered in a lattice and uh, these molecules are essentially in fixed position. In liquid we have domains which are partially ordered. So in a short distance we have partial ordering where one end of the dipole is surrounded by large number of oppositely charged ends of the dipole from other molecules, but in a longer distance there is a less order or no order. Since these are interactions between permanent dipoles 
and also magnitude of charge separation is much larger compared to temporary and induced dipoles that we have encountered when we studied London interactions. Dipole-dipole interactions are much stronger interactions compared to London interactions. So as mentioned earlier, average dipole-dipole interaction is about 100 times stronger compared to average London interaction. Hydrogen bond is a form of dipole-dipole interaction. In fact, strictly speaking, looking at hydrogen bond, it is a dipole-dipole interaction. But compared to other dipole-dipole interactions, it is very strong. It is much stronger compared to an ordinary dipole-dipole interaction. For that reason, it is classified separately as a separate intermolecular interaction. An average hydrogen bond is about 100 times stronger compared to an average dipole-dipole interaction. There are two reasons why hydrogen bond is so exceptionally strong. First reason is that hydrogen does not have core electrons. Hydrogen atom does not have core electrons. So here, when we consider molecule of hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen shown in gray, so little hydrogen nucleus shown in gray, is actually just a proton. That proton is not surrounded by any core electrons. It is bonded here to fluorine. Fluorine nucleus is shown in red and fluorine core electrons in dark blue surrounding the nucleus. Bonding electrons, again, are shown as distorted electron cloud, and we can see that most of the bonding electrons are around fluorine atom. Very little of the bonding electron density is left around hydrogen. But here, most, the most important fact is that hydrogen atom itself does not have core electrons. So, negative end of the dipole, which is located on the fluorine atom, can approach hydrogen atom or proton in this case very closely and not being not, not being repelled by the core electrons so there is no obstacle to very close approach and formation of very strong bond when we compare that with bromomethane in this case in case of bromomethane you have already seen that uh, the, the bro how bromomethane is represented that uh, black nucleus represents carbon atom and red nucleus bromine Carbon atom or carbon nucleus is surrounded by core electrons. Bromine is negative end of the dipole. As negative end of the dipole approaches positive end carbon, it can come only so close before the excess electron density of bromine begins to interact and be repelled by core electrons of bromine. That limits the distance how close negative end of the dipole can approach positive end of the dipole. And that also limits the magnitude of dipole-dipole interaction. And so it ends up being much weaker compared to uh, hydrogen bond. Second reason why hydrogen bond is so strong is that highly electronegative elements, and those are nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, and those are actually three or three the most electronegative elements. There, are, there is nothing more electronegative than that. So only three the most electronegative elements when bonded to hydrogen are capable of hydrogen bonding. So those highly electronegative elements very strongly attract the shared electron pair. And that leaves hydrogen almost as a bare proton. It leaves almost no electron density around hydrogen atom. So again, when we look at molecule of hydrogen fluoride, we can see that all of the shared electron density has been attracted by the fluorine and very little is left around hydrogen. And that, as I said, leaves hydrogen as bare proton. So uh, that means that magnitude of the charge is rather large. Magnitude of both negative and positive charge in a dipole is rather large. And of course, interaction between the opposite charges is rather strong. Now, that's not the case if element is less electronegative, such as chlorine. With lower electronegativity, hydrogen atom is not completely stripped of electron density. There is still some uh, noticeable electron density left around hydrogen atom. In other words, degree of charge separation is lower. So as negative end of the dipole in case of hydrogen chloride approaches positive end of the dipole of another molecule, again, we end up with a case similar to what we have seen uh, before, that uh, negative end bumps into some electron density, but unlike previously where a neg a negative 
end of the dipole bumped into core electrons. Now it bumps into valence electrons, into valence electrons that is left around hydrogen. And again, that limits the magnitude of the dipole-dipole interaction. So interaction ends up being noticeably or considerably weaker compared to hydrogen bond. When two compounds are mixed, they may or may not be miscible. If they are miscible, they will mix together and form a uniform mixture. If they are immiscible, they will separate into two layers. There are also borderline cases where two compounds are partially miscible, which means that they will form a mixture, uniform mixture, if they are mixed in certain ratios. But when that ratio is exceeded, then they separate into two layers. Whether two compounds will be miscible or not depends on their intermolecular interactions, more specifically on the strength and type of their intermolecular interactions. We will examine liquids, because that's the easiest system to consider, whether two liquids are miscible in each other. So when we mix two liquids, if they are miscible, they form a solution. And in general, by convention, liquid that is present in larger amount is the solvent, and one in smaller amount, the solute. In the process of dissolving liquids one in the other, intermolecular interactions between molecules of solvent have to be broken, and also intermolecular interactions between molecules of solute have to be broken. That requires input of energy. So that process is endothermic. And as those interactions are broken, new set of intermolecular interactions are formed. Those are intermolecular interactions between molecules of solvent and solute. And that is, of course, exothermic process. That process releases energy. Depending on relative interplay between the two processes, process is either thermodynamically favorable or not. Of course, we should also keep in mind that whether process is favorable or not does not depend only on enthalpy, that means energies of intermolecular interactions, but also on entropy, degree of randomness or disorder of the system. And uh, formation of mixture always results in increased entropy. So formation of mixture is always favored uh, from entropy standpoint. So when we have two compounds, one exhibits London interactions only, which means it's non-polar, and the other one is polar and exhibits much stronger dipole-dipole interactions. They are unlikely to be miscible, because in order for them to be miscible, strong dipole-dipole interactions of, among the molecules of polar compound have to be broken to make room for non-polar molecules in between them. Of course, also weak London interactions will be broken. But those strong dipole-dipole interactions and weak London dipole interactions will then be replaced by interactions between molecules of solute and solvent. These interactions are uh, something we've not covered so far, but it, they are easy to understand. They are dipole-induced dipole interactions. So permanent dipole in polar molecule will induce a dipole in non-polar molecule, and then through electrostatic interactions they will interact. These interactions are actually rather weak. They are much weaker than dipole-dipole interactions, which means that if this process were to occur, if these two liquids were to mix, strong dipole-dipole interactions would have been replaced by much weaker dipole-induced dipole interactions. And that's thermodynamically unfavorable. At the same time, of course, weak London interactions would be replaced by somewhat stronger uh, dipole-induced dipole interactions. But that's not enough to compensate for, uh, for replacement of much stronger dipole-dipole interactions with weaker dipole-induced dipole interaction. For that reason, the two, the two liquids will be immiscible. And in fact, if any of the non-polar molecules manage to squeeze in among the polar molecules, they will be expelled by the polar molecules, which will tend to reform dipole-dipole interactions. And so mixing will very quickly result in a separation of two layers. Here, uh, bottom layer is shown as being more dense uh, molecules that exhibit dipole-dipole interaction and less dense those that exhibit only Van der Waals, oh sorry, only London interactions.